Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Friday, July 1st, 2022. I'm Ash Bennington, joined today by Mark Ritchie II. But first, let's take a look at what happened in U.S. equity markets today. I would call things pretty much flat-ish. Oh, they're moving a little bit here at the close. Uh, NASDAQ uh, looks like it's up about nine-tenths of 1%. S&P 500 up a little over 1%. And Dow Jones Industrial Average off up, excuse me, I should say, uh, a little over 1% uh, as well here on the day. Let me give you some of those numbers closing out. NASDAQ here above 11,000 at 11,127. S&P 500 closing out at 3,825. Relatively passive uh, day here in markets, but obviously lots of breaking news, particularly on the crypto side to talk about. We've got Mark Ritchie here with us today. Mark, we were talking a little bit off camera. We're both champing at the bit to get on the air. Lots to talk about. What's going on first in U.S. equity markets? Ash, good to be with you. Way to kick off. Uh holiday weekend, at least for those of us in the U.S., yeah, with some interesting things to talk about. As far as U.S. equities are concerned, I would best describe things kind of in a state of no man's land. So if you look over the, you know, the past few months, we've gone from people doubting whether we were in a bear market to sort of, that is now, there's nobody arguing that anymore because, you know, the textbook definitions have all been met. Um, the question from here becomes, uh, how severe is this going to be, the cyclical versus secular? Ironically, I think last time I was on, somebody uh, picked up uh, a recap of the Real Vision headlines saying I called for a secular bear market. <laughs> for the record, I didn't. However, the conditions are potentially there. So uh, the things we're looking at right now, uh, we can get in on the fundamental and the technical side. Where would you like me to start? Well, let's start with the fundamentals. One of these questions that's been floating around uh, is not just whether we're in a bear market. As you say, that one's been answered. But now the question of are we in a recession? Kathy Wood uh, out a couple of days ago earlier this week saying that we are in a recession. Lots of our guests saying we are currently in a recession. Of course, the official definition of recession is dated after the fact by the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, but when you're in a recession, you know, it's kind of the old joke. You're in a recession when you think you are. And there are a lot of people out there right now who think we are. Right. And this is a really good point, right? Uh, your point about lagging, I would love to even take that a step further is to say, normally, by the time you have specifically job losses or these larger negative GDP prints is usually towards the end of the move in terms of equities lower. So without jumping in a camp, and this is where I'm trying to stay agnostic and have an open mind uh, in terms of I don't have a hard opinion on you know, recession or not. But here's what I would say is most important, I think, for people to be watching. If we don't have a recession, uh, according to our work at Minervini Private Access, historically speaking, we're probably close to the lows. Most cyclical bear markets with where we don't have a recession correct in the neighborhood of 20 to 25%. Well, we're there. You know, the, the taxi has already taken us to that location in terms of at least if you look at the historical percentages. So that means this market is, you know, potentially bottoming if it hasn't, it's in, it's in a bottoming more or less process. Obviously the elephant in the room is, well, what if we have a recession? Then it's going to depend, of course, on the duration and the depth. Now, let's say to your point, we're already in recession because Q1 was, was negative. And I think Atlanta Fed came out this week and said, and revised down, uh, Q2. Well, let's say we're in a, a recession right now and the Fed quickly backs off. I, I still think you could be in that bottoming scenario. And that is a scenario I think investors need to have a, a, at least an open mind to. This is where flexibility is everything. Uh, I think it, it is very possible we have another large leg down. I also think it's very possible we're putting in a bottom. And I'm trying to hold both those in tension and then look at Obviously, the fundamental data as it rolls out, but even more importantly, the technicals. So if you want me to make the strongest prediction I would make about the U.S. equity market right now, and this is recession or not, but if we do have a recession, everyone needs to understand one thing. Bull markets are born out of recessions. So this, you should not be afraid of a recession. 
how that is, of course, assuming you've managed your household well going into it and you don't get clobbered or haven't gotten clobbered to this point. I've been talking about cash and, and the value of cash for a while. Uh, the other point I would make, though, is the prediction I would make is that if we're going to have a recession at some point, the market will actually look through the recession and everybody will probably not believe it. And that's the trap, in my opinion. And when I say I'm trying to stay flexible and open minded is meaning I'm trying not to get married to it, just a fundamental narrative so that then you miss a, a major opportunity. And I, that's actually what if you were to ask gun, gun to my head, ask me, what do I hope is going to happen? I would hope the data gets really bad and the bearish just gets end of the world. And then the market in terms of its price action starts to tell a different story. This is precisely what we had after COVID about two years ago. And historically, the market bottoms on average three to six months ahead of the economy. So when things look bad is often when the market starts to, if you look at the bottom in March 09, you look at the bottom in you know March of 2020 and some of these other cyclical and secular periods. So I would just have an open mind. Now we can get into the technicals in terms of what, what am I going to look for in terms of a change of character that would make me say, wow, sit up in my chair and go, it's time to potentially look to get more aggressive. Because right now I'm very cautious and very defensive. Yeah, you know, many good points there. Let's unpack some of that. Talking about really bad data, the, uh, the Atlanta Fed uh, now cast out today minus 2.1% print on GDP. Obviously, this is a leading indicator. Uh, this is an attempt to estimate using high frequency data series what the GDP print is going to be. There's definitely some variability, especially when things swing around. Uh, but as you say, a very negative sign. Second, the point that you made, such an important one, something that we talk about on Real Vision a great deal, uh, this notion of the challenges when things are moving badly against you. The important points, things like asset allocation, position sizing, risk management, understanding the risks inherent in leverage, all of these uh, conversations that investors, uh, folks who've been in the business for some time, are really at the core, uh, not just about picking which stock is a winner and which stock is a loser, absolutely critical for investors to know. I also wanted to pick up on something else that you mentioned there, uh, which is, of, uh, of course, Mr. Minervini, a conversation that you had with Mark Minervini today, uh, actually aired on 614, but very relevant uh, to what we're talking about right now. Um, let's take a look at that conversation uh, right now. Now, in a bull market, I mean, if you happen to get you know, the bull market right early on and you buy a bunch of stocks and, and you have a big bull market, yeah, you're, you're going to probably you know, do really well being diversified. However, two things. One, when the market goes down and you're in a bear market, diversification is not going to protect you. Yeah, because correlation goes to one. Exactly. Everything gets it's correlated. just going to dilute you. you yeah. know? But the problem is, is it doesn't protect you on the downside and it dilutes you on the upside. So the key is, is to, to instead of being diversified, Back to your point also that you said in the beginning, you said to have that low risk, you got to have your timing really well. That's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. So if you're going to have the big positions, then you have to have your timing well and you have to have the risk under control. And they go hand in hand. In order to keep the risk tight, you have to have your timing. If you have your timing right or you have good timing and you have your risk under control for when your timing is off, you can take the big positions. We don't take position, big positions all the time. If When things are working well, we take big positions. And to go back to Stan Druckenmiller, because I'm a big fan of Stan, and he said that, and Soros said that, to make money every now and then, you gotta be a pig. Diversification will not protect you. Picking up on a point that you made earlier when you were talking about this challenge uh, with the historical correlation between equities and fixed income breaking down. Obviously, a conversation that you had with Mark Minervini here on Real Vision. How would you characterize your big takeaways from that conversation? Well, there's a lot of them. And obviously, we're going to get into maybe even more specific risk management ones when we, when we shift to crypto. But if you look at this bear market, since it started in November, and I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, can evangelize any type of sort of risk management strategy. But, you know, one I have been an evangelist for is just the idea of simply cutting risk 
uh, when things are not working or raising cash. Cash is a position. So let's look at the other alternatives. Stocks and bonds. Bonds is a hedge versus raising cash. Has not performed well. Precious metals. Not performed well. Uh, volatility strategies. Volatility has probably, unless it's been very niche and specific, volatility just kind of stayed in that slightly elevated, but never giving you that, you know, that big outside burst where maybe your tail risk guys, you know, had had a good run. There just has not been a there's not been a position like cash. So the idea being, you know, for me, this is where I don't hold it arbitrarily. Uh, I, I hold it at opportune times. And that was mark diversification has been one of the worst because in a bear market right now, 85% of stocks in the NASDAQ and the NYSE are trading below their long-term moving average. So if you have a, a large diversified subset of that, you're probably performing in kind with the averages, if not worse, because some of those negative tails are much worse than the positive ones. We know that you know areas of the NASDAQ are down 80, 90 percent. Uh, if you were hiding in, in commodities in some of these cyclicals, they worked for a bit. But even now, some of those are coming under pressure. So this is where uh, some type of cash allocation or strategy to move into cash, I think, is essential. Yeah, I'm looking right now at my uh, Bloomberg worksheet where I have all the indices uh, tracked across multiple time horizons. And as we were saying at the top of the show, uh, NASDAQ uh, composite up about nine tenths of 1% on the day, we should say, on the week, down about 4%, year to date, off almost 29%. Uh, one year, a little bit better off 23%. S&P, uh, again, up today about 1% down about two and a half percent, two point three percent to be exact on the week for year to date off just a hair's breadth under 20 percent year to date and off 11 percent, almost 11 and a, actually over 11 and a half percent on a one year basis. Yeah, well, and the, the nature of this bear market has been more of the grinder. It has just it's grinded you down, given you a little bit of hope and then grinded you down. And that has been, you know, really what we've seen all year. The question, of course, depending again, like we talked about on the economic data, do we get some type of a swifter leg down that maybe gives some people a sense that we put in a capitulation? I'm not sure. I could I could easily see a scenario where we do. I could see a scenario where if we continue to go lower, it may just be same song, add a few more verses. So it it really, this is where you got to look at things one day at a time. I will say on the technical side, every accumulation attempt we've had, and what I mean by that, I've talked about this a bit before, is when you get a valid rally a few days off the low, confirmed by some volume, those have all been sold into. Just for a little bit of history, uh, I read a, a report this week from William O'Neill and company that said, the every every bear market back, I believe, to 1970 usually has six or so on average such failures. I think we're on number five right now. So again, we're sort of right in that average of what you would expect to see in in a in a in a bear market, whether it's you know cyclical or secular. We may see more lately. The first couple of, of rallies were able were able to retake the 50, one retested the declining 200. Right now, we're kind of we weren't even really able to retake the 20 day. So this market is oversold. But again, it's just kind of in no man's land. And the last point I would make, though, is this is where if you get some type of more systemic shock or issue, things could really come unglued because liquidity is poor. So I want to be careful that I'm I am while I'm I'm holding both things in tension. The worst case scenario would be some type of Maybe it's a credit blow up. Maybe it's a sovereign blow up where all the aircraft has lost lift. That's what will take you into a nosedive for people that, you know, weren't around in 08. We were in a bear market before Lehman failed. Then Lehman failed and it was just a bloodbath. So not calling for that. Uh, I think this is where the, the guy from ECRI would say there's an open window of vulnerability uh, for a bigger issue. 
Well, I would tend to agree with that even on the technical side. You don't have a lot of strong technical support under this market. That's what I'm, and the liquidity is quite poor. So if we get a lot of heavy volume selling, there's only one way for things to go. Now, again, if I see the opposite, and this is where what I think folks should be looking for on the, on the upside is, do we get some type of positive breath thrust? And there are a number of drivers. There are also some bullish narratives. And there's some, you know, things like a ceasefire uh, or, or some type of agreement, you know, that will definitely, I would think, produce a relief rally. I want to see what do the technicals in terms of breath volume look like underneath. Uh, I also think coming into the election, uh, without getting into the politics, I think any type of e uh, political gridlock is generally bullish if, of course, we, we get some type of a red wave, uh, assuming that ahead of time. So those are a couple. Again, keeping an open mind uh, to both sides. Yeah, so much to talk about there. Uh, Ekri, of course, our old friend uh, Lakshman Akutan, it'd be great to get him back on uh, to talk about some of these uh, cyclical aspects. You know, I, just looking <clears throat> at my screen here uh, on the day uh, data that came out, so Eurozone has hit uh, record inflation highs now at 8.6%, up from month prior, 8.1%, a significant hot inflation print in the Eurozone. Uh, additionally, uh, we have the U.S. manufacturing uh, index, the ISM index specifically, decreasing uh, to 53 this month from 56.1 last month. This is a high-frequency data series that many people look at uh, as a leading indicator of potential economic growth, particularly uh, Ralph Powell, our CEO and founder at Real Vision, uh, uses that series uh, very much to think about how he sees growth shaping up. So some negative indicators, as you said, some indications, uh, in your words, that the aircraft may be losing lift on both sides, really, of the Fed's dual mandate. On the one hand, decelerating growth. On the other hand, global inflation rising, price pressures, supply chain challenges, pressure on prices. Let me just end, too, maybe with the U.S. on a couple of positives or other things for people to be watching. So we did have on, on uh, June 13th, we had a 60 to 1 or more than 60 to 1 down volume day on the NYSE. That is, that's tantamount to someone vomiting, you know, or purging, uh, you know, if you will. The, the good news is often those happen, uh, you know, near bottoming processes. The bad news, of course, is sometimes they come in clusters. So there may be, you know, if you have the flu, sometimes one purge isn't enough. So there may be more. The sentiment is getting very bearish, very bearish. I think AAII is now, or, uh, last week, hit the, the worst in 40 years. And then looking at some groups, biotech is starting to, to buck the trend. That's an area I have folks watching. And uh, as crazy as it may sound, China looks like it might have bottomed. So if we've made a low, uh, you know, a contrarian place to potentially look would be China if that continues to trade well. So Again, in the bottoming scenario, those are the areas I'd be looking at. Okay, Mark, we've managed to hold ourselves back for a full 20 minutes uh, talking about crypto. This is something that we were talking about off camera. Uh, some breaking news here in the space, Voyager Digital uh, suspending redemptions right now today. This is stories uh, that we've seen. We saw it in Celsius, a uh, CFI lending platform. We recently also saw it, uh, of course, at CoinFlex. I wanted to make reference to a conversation that I had today uh, with Mark Lamb. This is the CEO of CoinFlex, uh, who came on Real Vision and answered a whole series of questions. We spent about an hour walking through some of the challenges that they're having over there in detail. I think it's the most detailed in. Uh, interview to date that he's done where he really gets into the granular details about what they're doing. Uh, this is a special report, CoinFlex Fallout, that aired on Real Vision today. It's available on the Real Vision platform, on Twitter, on YouTube. Let's take a look. This is something that most exchanges do. They have uh, uh, non-liquidation accounts that are institutional customers or large whale customers. Um, this is something that is commonplace not only in crypto, but also in the traditional financial industry. And although it's common, although it may be commonplace, it's still not something we should be doing going forward. It's, it's in hindsight, uh, we would not have done it, you know, in the past. Um, the reason, the reason for an account like this, the reason for an arrangement like this is it enables the 
customer to trade, um, you know, with 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 more confidence that they will not be liquidated and keep cash on the sidelines, enable to in in order to fund those liquidations without having to worry that their ability to meet those margin calls uh, won't be hindered by the fact that they might be asleep. And you know, every uh, every previous margin call was promptly met. So you know, this is this. This customer is a longtime customer of CoinFlex. Um, every prior margin call was met. You know, there's there's a lot of clarity around this situation. Um, the goal now is just to make depositors whole, and that's what we're spending every um, you know every, every every moment working on. Mark Ritchie, I know you have lots of thoughts. Well, without being overly critical of this particular individual, and I have not watched the entire interview, but I'm going to be watching it. And I have been following the unfolding of sort of the deleveraging in the crypto space uh, from a distance in terms of reading. This is exactly the type of thing we were talking about in the Real Visionary series of what you shouldn't do. It couldn't be a better textbook example. Here you have somebody that, that has decided well, look, we've got this one client account. Think of it as a position, however you want, and have no reason to think that this that X, Y, Z could never happen. Then it happens, and all of a sudden their business is insolvent. That is the same thing as me going, my broker allowing me to, to hold a 3X uh, position because it never gaps down. But if it ever did, my whole account would go into default. This is craziness. Uh, is is the only way to really put it. Uh, and if I literally tweeted about this three or four hours ago in the wake of the whole Luna, not even knowing we were going to talk about this today, Ash, how serendipitous this is. The idea, though, is if you haven't learned this lesson, and it's on every level, I don't care if you're running a business, if you're managing your own account, managing money for other people, you cannot say, well, that'll never happen, but if it does, we're out of business. That's not risk management. Uh, and I, I've been... Trying to gent gently critique this type of thinking for years, uh, and it, it, this is to me right now in crypto. This is they're having their Lehman moment, where people realize the same thing that we saw in Archegos from a year and a half ago, uh, you know, and and some of these other blowups where people are realizing, wow, our entire business was tethered to well, something that we didn't think could happen that then just happened overnight. Yeah, this question, is this the Lehman moment for crypto? Uh, I'm going to give you a, the name of an obscure fund, the High Grade Structured Credit Strategies Enhanced Leverage Fund. Not exactly a household name. Uh, so you mentioned this idea of a Lehman moment. That was October 15, 2008. In, on June 15, 2007, the prior year, about uh, 16, 17 months before, that hedge fund that I just read the name of uh, and another hedge fund at Bear Stearns defaulted. Uh, and this was a story that the Wall Street Journal ran. The moral of the story is the moment when we start to see these distresses in the system, when you start to see things like forced liquidations, when you start to see positions getting sold out, when you start to see redemptions being denied, when you start to see all of these signs of trouble, can be a very long time before you hit the true bottom, the true panic moment, the true maximum pain point. Now, am I saying we are in a June 15th moment and we're going to be heading into an October 15th moment? No, but it is a potential reminder that that can happen. I shouldn't say no, I should say the real answer is we don't know, we don't know. And the other thing that's so striking, Mark, from your comments about this, and I think you're spot on in the way that you're thinking about this, one of the things that my sense is of this space of crypto is something that I spend a lot of time in is that folks on the crypto side, many of whom are absolutely brilliant guys and gals who have PhDs in computer science and statistics and those sorts of things, in many ways, Mark, they are learning the lessons that we learned in traditional capital markets in the 2007, 2008 phase, as though you know people who didn't already know them. They are learning those lessons anew for the first time. The two sides did not speak to each other. It seems to me in some ways, and again, not a critique of any individual person, but there was an ethos in the crypto space that somehow this really amazing technology, and the technology is amazing. I think, uh, as Mark pointed out, this incredible ability to have these 
distributed, decentralized networks, validate things. This is a tremendous advance in computer science. It's an incredible thing, but it hasn't solved flaws in human nature. It hasn't solved excessive speculation. It hasn't solved irrational exuberance. It hasn't solved risk management questions. It hasn't solved leverage in the system. You know, these challenges, it's almost like we've built them anew in the crypto space. And now we're learning the hard way that crypto digital assets are not a panacea for problems of human nature that are inherent in economics. Yeah, I don't know that I could have said that any better, Ash. And, you know, I would just make the point, uh, you're dead on one in terms of it could be could could this be the the bear mo the, the the bear stearns hedge funds failures in you know summer of 07 could it be the failure of bear stearns in march of 08 you know lehman and and uh, you know our, september of 08 who knows right, right. and uh, the one thing it does seem though is that the speed of these markets seems to be a little faster just yeah. you know if you look at luna it failed in 6 to 7 days you know 30 to 40 billion in market cap just wiped off like that uh, well, because there there was no Fed, there were no uh, coordinated other efforts for people to come in and support any you know this market. And I'm not going to you know get into views on whether there should or shouldn't. The reality is, it's just what happened. I, right. I've never seen that much market cap wiped off to zero that quickly. Normally, it's you know coming from the tradfi type world, a zero takes some time. You know. <laughs> You gotta, you know, you go through a bankruptcy, and even then, the common stock, you know, trades around that kind of thing. You know, this was a full-on wipeout in really short order. Um, to me, this is one of those growing pains. If you're a crypto bull long term, not that you're welcoming the pain, but to say, look, the actors who who don't didn't learn these lessons, they they need to potentially be weeded out of the system, and uh, you know, for those potential bulls. I think you want to see, uh, I saw a headline this week, Goldman's potentially you know, trying to put together groups to bid on some of these assets. That's actually a good sign. That, that shows that crypto may be growing up at least you know, three years ago, there wouldn't have been an investment bank leading a group to do that, right. uh, in, in my view. So that's a positive. Right now, though, on the technicals, I would just add, you know, I would not be touching this personally. And I made this uh, point a couple of, uh, when, probably, probably a month ago, when Bitcoin was still around 30,000 after the Luna failure, a lot of people saying, hey, this held up pretty well. Well, it had uh, for the time being, but there was contagion. You know, to your point about where are we? Is it, you know, is it two years before Lehman? Are we in the middle? Is it after? We didn't know, but the price action of Bitcoin was not very good. It broke hard and didn't rally. Well, if you look right now, same story. We broke hard then to 20 and we have not been able to bounce. That doesn't mean the low's not in. It doesn't mean it's in. I'm saying, and again, my style, as I've been clear on before, I am not a falling knife catcher. Uh, and crypto right now is a house of falling knives. They're, they're all in deep downtrends and they're all just sort of looking for bottoms. If you're a, a deep value tech type person, then maybe this is Christmas come early for you. But for right now, it's an avoid for me and wait to see how things shake out. I do think, assuming that the, the digital asset ecosystem survives, there's gonna be some phenomenal opportunities on the other side. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we should say Bitcoin right now trading under 20,000, uh, 19,584. I also wanted to talk about Voyager Digital, uh, which as I said, I think they suspended uh, redemptions and trading, effectively all activity on the platform uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern time today, so some uh, two hours before we started uh, on the air today. High in November of, uh, of, of 21, this is the 52-week high of 25.17. It's just gotten blown out since then. It's trading at 58 cents right now uh, and a bit of downward momentum. It appears on the news, as you would expect, of them halting redemptions. Um, I wanted to point out this, uh, looking at the questions uh, at the comments, as I always do on YouTube as we stream here. Uh, Jeff Maitland makes an important point. Uh, you can't have a Lehman moment in DeFi, my guy. We've been talking about this very broadly. Crypto is as though it's a, a singular monolithic uh, asset class where you know everything functions in a heterogeneous way. That's not true. We should point out uh, that these are, I guess you would say the term of art in the space is a CFI. These are centralized 
digital asset platforms, whether it's Celsius we're talking about or Voyager Digital, or in the case of, uh, of Mr. Lamb, CoinFlex, these are not true DeFi platforms. People in the space who are true believers in digital assets, who are true believers in decentralization of finance would say, well, that's exactly what you would expect to happen on a centralized platform because you have human beings who are fallible. We've seen it time and time again, making mistakes as they did at Lehman Brothers, as they did at Bear Stearns, as they did at, you know, pick your name of secure of uh, big banks or mortgage originators in the 2007, 2008 period. Folks who are in the DeFi space would say, we don't have true decentralization on those platforms. And again, to make this even more complex, rich and ramified, Bitcoiners are also sitting back when they see this thing and saying, well, we told you show, so you shouldn't be speculating on what they would call shit coins. You shouldn't be speculating on anything that's not Bitcoin, and you should own Bitcoin in a way where you control your own private keys, not your keys, not your coins, they would say. So it is a very rich and complicated space. This is a, a very big conversation. We are very early in this space. It's an inflection point when we see these type of things happen, but there are also a lot of divergent strands to keep track of here. And that's what we try to do here on Real Vision on this show and elsewhere is to try and have fantastic guests on like you so we can start to try and untangle what those strands are, what they mean, and why they're relevant to individuals. Ash, I think that was about as good a summary as I could do in terms of uh, what's going on. And the question in my mind is, what inning are we in? And, you know, this is one of those where it could go on for months and months. Maybe we see headlines like this Voyager one at, at least for the next few months, maybe through the rest of the summer. And if we continue, of course, to see cascading crypto prices, are we going to see, you know, people talking about certain people getting margin called or knockout levels? Uh, you know, and similarly, what we're seeing in equities, is crypto going to have that? you know, big sort of candle down capitulation type move where the last remaining weak holders who are sweating right now uh, are forced out. I don't know. Uh, very possible, though. Again, to my point earlier about this is why you want to just be careful if you're in the, hey, it looks cheap. You know, it, it looked cheap at 30 and at 40, and here we are at 20. So if you don't mind taking the ride to 10, uh, then maybe it is cheap. Uh, I just think, again, you have to think risk first with every one of these decisions. And crypto's in one of these uh, moments right now, like we've seen in the past, just just a sort of a different iteration. Uh, and you have to think risk first. Yeah. Talking of which, things that could go on for a while, you and I could have this conversation for another three hours on or off camera. But we have to let people get to their summer weekend. Mark, as we come to the conclusion of this conversation, final thoughts key takeaways that you'd like to leave our audience with in about 60 seconds, if you could? Well, I think the big one is just keep an open mind. Uh, try not to get yourself completely married to any one narrative uh, and then allow uh, you know, the information specifically with what you're seeing uh, in the price action uh, dictate some of your actions. So that's always been one of my things to say, look, OK, if I see a and B, then I have to do something and allow that to potentially start changing my mind. I'm holding a lot of cash right now, but I am I am looking every single day to see, do I see a shifting or a changing in the wind uh, to potentially redeploy some of that cash? That's exactly uh, what I would advise people to have a plan and stick to it. Uh, and going forward, I think there's going to be great opportunities. It's just a matter of making sure you manage the risk uh, and, and really hone in on your timing. Mark Ritchie, always great to have you on the show. A great conversation as always. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ash. Have yourself a great weekend. Thanks for watching Real Vision Daily Briefing, everyone. Just a reminder, U.S. markets are closed on Monday in celebration of the 4th of July holiday. We'll be back with Tony Greer on Tuesday. Enjoy the long weekend, everybody.